They were called the greatest show on court for a reason. In the early 2000s, the Sacramento Kings set the standard for what great teamwork and communication could accomplish. Divas on the move, lays it off to Weber. Capturing the hearts and minds of basketball fans around the world. And while they will be forever celebrated as one of the greatest and most entertaining teams in NBA history, one year still haunts the California capital to this day. That will do it. The Los Angeles Lakers winning here in Sacramento. Fans, front office executives, reporters, coaches, and players still wonder what could have been tortured by the memories of just how close Sacramento was to their first and only championship. Welcome back to the year that the Sacramento Kings were the best team in the NBA. Welcome back to the deafening roar of Arco Thunder. Weber back to Bibby, has the open shot. Yes! Welcome back to the genius of Rick Adelman's coaching. I just think that was a great series. We had a great team. I regret not getting to the next level. The steadiness of Chris Weber's leadership. Twirling move by Weber, who wraps it around the leader speeds to Chris. The silky smoothness of Peja Stojakovic's shooting stroke. Another three-pointer by Peja. He is six of nine from downtown. And the iron clasps of Doug Christie's defense. Doug Christie, the defensive player for the Kings, getting involved. Welcome back to one of the greatest, most physical, and most heated rivalries in sports, turning the West Coast into a Northern California versus Southern California war zone. Offensive foul on Rick Fox. Oh, Christie hey. put it back in Fox's face and pushes him back again, and we have pushing and shoving between the Kings and Lakers here early. Welcome back to the joy and pain of the greatest and most terrible season in Kings history. Welcome to 2002, the three-part miniseries presented by the Locked on Kings podcast. Hello and welcome to part two of 2002, the three-part miniseries remembering the Sacramento Kings' great and terrible year. My name is Matt George. I am a Sacramento sports radio host and multimedia journalist covering the Sacramento Kings for the last five seasons. During the 2001-2002 NBA season, I was just seven years old, a young diehard Kings fan who to this day still remembers the joys of watching the greatest show on court and the heartbreak of falling short in the Western Conference Finals. If you missed part one of the series, taking you through the Sacramento Kings' franchise record 61 win regular season, I highly encourage you to pause this episode right now and go back and listen to part one. Today on part two, we will dive into the first two rounds of the 2002 NBA playoffs where the Sacramento Kings faced off with John Stockton and Carl Malone's Utah Jazz, followed by Steve Nash and Dirk Nowitzki's Dallas Mavericks on the road to the Western Conference Finals. After securing the number one seed in the West with the best record in the NBA, the Sacramento Kings knew that they would have home court advantage all the way through the playoffs, including the NBA Finals, if they made it that far. Kings sixth man and electrifying bench scorer slash defender Bobby Jackson shares the confidence that that home court advantage and their entire regular season success gave the team heading into the postseason. It gave us a lot of confidence. You know, I think that was the one thing that, um, Throughout that season, when we had 61 wins, it was, you know, it was evident that going into the playoffs, we had the mentality that we wasn't going to lose on our home court. So, you know, we worked our butts off to get that home court advantage, had the best record. Um, so it gave us a lot of momentum going into the playoffs. And, and we knew uh, down the line that we did meet up with the Lakers, uh, it was going to be a dogfight. And we felt that we had the upper hand. Uh, at the end of the day, just because of our talent, um, our team um, chemistry and the effort that we played with every single night uh, with each other and the um, and the chemistry once we walked on the floor. So, you know, we had, it, it gave us a lot of confidence knowing that we were the best team in the league with the best record. So it just allowed us to just go into every game uh, with the confidence, um, the confidence and ability to, the ability to win every single game. Kings television analyst and former head coach Jerry Reynolds shared that even before the playoffs began, the general consensus around the league was that the 2002 NBA champion was going to come out of the West. When you looked at the league, there was nobody in the East that really rang the bell at that time, and you knew pretty much or you know, that whoever got out of the West would be the champion. And so 
uh, you know, uh, and that's the way it was. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody saw it any different that uh, whoever won the Laker King series when it came to that would almost assuredly uh, run through whoever came out of the East. The opening round of the 2002 NBA playoffs in the West was as follows. Number one seed Sacramento Kings taking on number eight seed Utah Jazz. Number two seed San Antonio Spurs versus number seven seed Seattle Supersonics. Number three seed Los Angeles Lakers versus number six seed Portland Trailblazers. And finally, number four seed Dallas Mavericks versus number five seed Minnesota Timberwolves. The Sacramento Kings and Utah Jazz had some recent history in the playoffs. In 1999, John Stockton and Carl Malone eliminated the Kings in the opening round of the playoffs that went a full five games. At that time, Sacramento was the sixth seed and Utah the third seed. The Kings led in that series two games to one, but lost game four by a point and game five in overtime. Carl Malone won the MVP during that regular season. In the 2001-2002 season, Utah finished 44-38, and the final team in the West with a win percentage over 500. John Stockton, at 39 years old, was playing in what would end up being his second-to-last season. Malone, at 38 years old, played two more seasons. The Kings defeated the Jazz in all four of their meetings during the regular season, winning by an average of 22.7 points a game. Simply put, the Jazz had no answer for the Kings during the regular season. But the playoffs are a different beast. Stockton, Malone, and Jazz head coach Jerry Sloan had the advantage of experience. Here's King's starting shooting guard and all-NBA defender Doug Christie. We had the utmost respect for them because they played extremely hard. They executed at a high level. Uh, Coaching was, I mean, Jerry Sloan was as good as it gets when it comes to coaching. And then you take into consideration that you had to go into Utah. (laughs) And if you've never been to Utah, man, those fans are right on top of you. And they do not let up one inch. I have the utmost respect for for them. Sacramento radio host Carmichael Dave pointed out the welcome difference between the 1999 and 2002 Kings Jazz Series. That was a passing of the torch. You know, Kings fans will remember that first year, the the strike short and 50 game year, facing off with the Jazz and taking them to five games after getting blown out at the Delta Center in game one, coming back and stealing game two. They remember the Chris Webber hit check to John Stockton, kind of establishing that, hey, we're a force to be reckoned with, if not now, certainly in the future. And then you fast forward, and, and, and the Kings, despite losing that one home game, they handled the Jazz pretty easily. And that was kind of like, all right, that's one last bit of our past put behind us. We've gotten over that hurdle now. Now, now we're going to continue on as we, you know, it was just, t- you didn't want to, nobody wants to overlook anyone because that's how you lose, but they certainly had a laser focus on Los Angeles. Bobby Jackson, who had the tough task of guarding Stockton multiple times in his career, said that the Kings still had to bring their A game. When you have John Stockton and Carl Malone, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say it was the passing of a torch. Um, I think it was it was more of a more respect thing for us. Um, you look at two guys in the organization that have done it and made it to the playoff for so many years. I think it was 15 to 18 plus years making it to the playoffs. And, you know, we just didn't go into that series taking these guys lightly because they were Hall of Famers. Um, not at the time, but future Hall of Famers. So we had to bring our A game. And playing in Utah was a tough task. And I think we was up for the challenge. And whenever you put Carl Malone and John Stockton on the floor together, you just know something's going to happen and you just didn't want to take them lightly. So we came in that series really locked in, loaded, and we kind of handled our business. Kings radio broadcaster Jason Ross remembers the difficulties in the series for the Kings despite their dominance over the Jazz during the regular season. It wasn't easy. What I remember that series, I know the Kings won at three games to one in the best of five, but... It was 1-1, so they lost home court advantage. The Jazz won game two, and game three was right there. John Stockton had a really big shot that could have changed the outcome of that series. Every game was close. They were not easy to beat. The Jazz are tough. They're physical, and there was the years of winning with Stockton, Malone, and Sloan, that just the physical pride that, yeah, it was a, a one versus eight, but it was not a cakewalk at all. It, it was it was difficult for the Kings to get through the Jazz, and I do feel it was a passing of the torch. On Saturday, April 20th, inside Arco Arena, the Kings opened up the best of five opening round with a hard-fought 89-86 victory over the Jazz. Lewis, Malone, Stockton, all with two fouls out there for Utah. Weber misfires Christie. 
keeps it alive. Divac comes up with it. Blocked by Karolinko. Second effort won't go. Boy, they are pounding each other down low. Marshall misfires on that one. Weber with another rebound. Terrific outlet pass. Stojakovic to finish. Stojakovic. Russell good helping out. Weber gets inside. Pretty shot from Weber. They anticipate too well, but they know what plays are coming. Dibby goes hard and puts it in. Close to tag. Trying to stop him, but Mike Bibby went right at him and he has a chance for a three-point play. Those highlights courtesy of NBC. By the way the two teams battled, you wouldn't have known that the Utah Jazz had struggled with Sacramento so much that season. They forced the Kings into a slow-paced, grinded-out style game. Carl Malone scored 25 points and pulled down 9 rebounds, and John Stockton did what he does best, dishing out 12 assists to go along with 10 points. The Kings, however, rode the wave of a strong overall team performance. Chris Webber led the way with 24 points, followed by 20 from Mike Bibby, 17 from Doug Christie, and 15 from Peja Stojakovic. Sacramento took full advantage of a 25-17 third quarter, creating enough separation to hold on for the victory. However, the Game 1 loss wouldn't take the fight out of the Utah Jazz, who came back with a very physical performance in Game 2, shocking the Arco Arena crowd with the 93-86 victory. Right out of the gate, Utah looked to set the tone with their physicality. In the first quarter, Carl Malone was issued a flagrant foul for making hard contact with Doug Christie as he attacked the rim. Christie would be able to pick it up. Right now, Chris Webber on the bench for Sacramento with two fouls. Jared Collins, the rookie for Utah, also with two fouls. Christie, nice move and a hard foul. And it's a flagrant. Flagrant foul call on Carl Malone and some pushing and shoving. Officials trying to get in between. Dick Bavetta doing a good job of getting Carl Malone out of the fray. And Christie walks away as well. The Jazz had a clear strategy. Go right at the Kings defenders and try to get them into foul trouble. It worked like a charm. Divac has his fifth foul. Crowd upset, but at least at first look, that, that seemed clearly like a block. And now that's the fourth team foul. Five on Divac, five on Weber. And these are serious problems now because here you are down in the game by 11 points. You have 10 minutes remaining. Do you sit down, Weber? Do you take Divac out of the game? Or do you hope that you can play through it and they're smart enough not to pick up their next foul? Neither team offensively was having a great night. Utah was fighting their way to the free throw line where they hit just 24 of their 39 attempts. And the Kings were struggling to take care of the basketball, finishing the night with an uncharacteristic 15 turnovers. However, in the fourth quarter, both teams found their jumpers. The Kings came storming back from 18 points down, making a run late in the fourth quarter. What was once an 18-point lead has been cut to six, and there's still plenty of time with this crowd now up on their feet. Here comes Jackson off the Malone miss. Weber, d four-point game. Here comes the Kings' vertibility. It's back to four now, and the momentum has obviously shifted. The Jazz would hang on after Kings center Vlade Divac fouled out. Five Utah players finished with double-figure scoring, including a team-high 19 points from Danielle Marshall off the bench. Stockton and Malone both finished with a double-double again, 13 points, 12 assists for John, and 18 points, 12 rebounds for Carl. In the time they did play, Vlade Divac and Chris Webber were the top two scorers for the Kings. Their foul trouble kept them from an even greater performance, which was the difference in the game. This loss at home started an ugly trend for the Sacramento Kings in the 2002 playoffs of dropping a home game early in the series, negating their home court advantage. Jason Ross. The irony of that year, they lost home court advantage in every series. They lost every one. Every one, they either lost game one or game two. Now, they were great on the road to get it back in most series. In some series, they finished teams. But the fact that they weren't as dominant at home in that entire series and, of course, ultimately losing game seven was, was truly one of the biggest uh, painful moments in Kings history. Bobby Jackson says the team had the confidence to overcome the home court losses and win the necessary games on the road. Those teams played exceptional well. They came in and beat us on our home court, uh, but we knew we had the DNA to make up to go into whether it was Utah, whether it was Dallas and L.A. and get a win. And so we were very confident that we had to make those games up. Of course, we wanted to win those, not lose any home games, and you can't predict that. And I think if you go back and do it again, I think most teams lose at least one out of those five or seven games at home. Um, so it's up to you as a team 
to try to get home court advantage back, and that's what we did when we went to Dallas and we went to Utah and L.A. So it was it was just something that we had the confidence. We had the, the moxie, and we had the firepower to go into any arena and win. And so well, that's what we did. Doug Christie. And I think of the mindset sometimes of a team. You know, we go in, we win game one, and maybe we, we took a, you know, we took a breath. And you take a breath, and a team like Utah will, will beat you. And then we went and handled our business. So um, we had uh, most respect for them, um, but we just had a really, really good team. This episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Sweat Block, the antiperspirant wipes that work like a charm. Doctor created and doctor recommended works for up to seven days per use. It's a dry shirt guarantee. If Sweat Block doesn't keep you dry, you get your money back. It's been featured and tested on the Rachel Ray Show by firefighters. If these wipes can handle their hot climate, it can handle yours. Best seller on Amazon for the past 10 years. You can check out their over 13,000 reviews manufactured in the USA and very easy to get. Like I mentioned, you can get them on amazon.com. You can also get them at your local CVS pharmacy or get them today at sweatblock.com and use promo code locked on for 20% off. Get yourself the sweat block antiperspirant wipes and stay dry. Does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, you're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV all together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part, there's no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with DirecTV Stream. You can learn more at DirecTV.com. That's DirecTV.com. Compatible devices are required. Content varies by package. Game three in Utah was just as physical, but this time it was the Kings who were the aggressors. Mike Bibby and Peja Stojakovic combined for 47 points, both shooting a perfect 9 of 9 from the free throw line, as it was the Kings who got the Jazz in foul trouble, forcing John Stockton to foul out of the game. Sacramento, who was only able to score more than 25 points in a quarter once in the first two games of the series, exploded for 32 points in the first quarter in Game 3. But just like in Games 1 and 2, tensions were high and tempers flared. Momentarily, back to the basket, the dunk is missed, a foul called inside. And here's some tension flares. Oster tag was underneath of Christie. Christie pushed him away. And this series has continued to heat up in these teams. Had some playoff history between them, having met in the first round of 99 as well. Uh, Chris Webber's walking Doug Christie out of there. With the exception of the first quarter, Utah hung around with the Kings for most of the game. They made up ground in the second quarter, and the game was closed from there on out. Five ties and five lead changes, although the Kings had the lead for 38 out of the 48 minutes. Utah went on a 13-0 run to take the lead late with just over three minutes remaining, but the Kings battled back and closed the door on the Jazz's potential upset. The Jazz lead it inside of two minutes to play, 82-80. to Last six trips coming up empty, one point in almost six and a half minutes. Good backdoor cut. Bibby with the play, but give the assist to Doug Christie. Shot clock continues to grind. Stockton from alone inside. The basket in the foul. Well, what would you expect with a minute and a half left? John Stockton and Carl Malone pick and roll. He finds him going to the basket. There's the screen. There's the roll. Beautiful little bounce pass. Carl Malone absorbs the contact from Scott Pollard. Malone completes the three-point play, and the Jazz now lead it 85-82. Sacramento has 12 turnovers. Bibby runs over Stockton, who's called for the block, and Jerry Sloan is beside himself, almost running into the locker room. Wow, that's a big call. Jerry Sloan thought that was Sacramento's 13th turnover of the second half. The referee, David Jones, did not agree with Sloney. So Michael Bibby will get to the free throw line. Leading scorer for the Sacramento Kings. With 24, he nails the first. The Kings from the free throw line are 28 
for 31, while the Utah Jazz only 19 of 26. Well, there's a lot of ways to get it done. Sacramento is doing it on the offensive boards and the free throw line. Sacramento would hold on thanks to solid defense and clutch free throws, forcing the Jazz to play in Game 4 with their backs against the wall. After a couple of three-point victories in Games 1 and 3, the Kings enjoyed a 91-86 victory in Utah to win the series and advance to the Western Conference semifinals for the second straight year. Pacia Stojakovic led the way with 30 points in the victory, Chris Webber right behind him with 23 points. Sacramento had to hand it to the Jazz, even though the Kings steamrolled Utah during the regular season, it was a much harder road to the second round than anyone anticipated. Every single game of the series was closer than all of the regular season games. Sacramento averaged 113 points against the Jazz over the year, but never scored more than 93 points in the playoffs. Even with Utah's fight, Kings television announcer Grant Napier wasn't surprised with Sacramento's ability to win on the road to secure the series. That was the end of you know the Stockton and, and Malone era, kind of, and the Kings had shown during the regular season that they were just a, a better all-around team. And as far as the Kings winning on the road, it really didn't surprise me because that entire year, anytime you got off the bus walking into an opposing building, the feeling among the Kings were they were going to win. That's how good they were. That's how confident that they were. So, no, it really didn't surprise me that they won both games in Salt Lake City. You know, as this series panned out and as it proved, the Kings were just a better all-around team and the best team won that series. Jerry Reynolds. I think it's a case the Kings were significantly better. I mean, you, you wouldn't have been surprised if Utah had gotten another game in there, uh, but uh, it was a case where they weren't quite the same Utah Jazz of the past, as, as, as you pointed out. I mean, Malone and Stockton certainly weren't quite the same, for sure, especially Stockton. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it would have been very surprising had, it, had the Kings not won it, the way they did. Bobby Jackson. It just allowed us just to come in with more confidence, being the best team in the league, but also going against a formidable foe that we knew um, if we didn't come in prepared, well prepared, playing great defense and being efficient on the offensive end, that there was a chance that they could win games. And so we just wanted to come in more focused and, and, and not too scared. Um, but we had, you know, the ability just to. You know, I'll play them, I'll last them, especially with the, with the uh, core group that we had on the floor every single night. So the Kings won the series three games to one and advanced to the semifinals for a meeting with the fourth seed Dallas Mavericks, who swept the Minnesota Timberwolves in the opening round. More rested and with a young dynamic duo in Steve Nash and Dirk Nowitzki, Sacramento knew that they had their work cut out for them. Bobby Jackson. Yo, we had to be locked in with every team that we played. You know, we knew we was going to get everybody's best effort. Um, we knew that we had to be at the top of our game. And, and so going into Dallas, I think it was something that, you know, when you have Steve Nash, Dirk, Nick Van Exel, Michael Finley, that's something that you have to bring to the table every single night. And I think that's something that we did. Um, and we made sure that we played at a tempo that they wasn't comfortable with. We, we played off each other. We moved the ball well. And we just we took advantage of our matchups, and I think that was the one thing that we really, really relied on. And we tried to make Steve Nash guard as much as possible, wear him down, uh, and put him and Dirk as many pick and rolls as possible. Um, so our bigs did an amazing job with distributing the ball to me, Mike Pasia, and uh, Doug to allow us to be successful in that series. Jason Ross. I have a lot of memories of this series, and they, they played Dallas a couple different years, but this series particularly, because one thing I do remember, I want to say it was game three where both Doug Christie and Peja Stojakovic got hurt. Doug came back in and was was truly amazing. A Dallas team that beat the Kings three out of four in the regular season, if I remember right, the last time they played in the regular season was without Dirk, and they got him pretty good. So a lot of people thought Dallas was going to beat the Kings, even though the Kings were the one seed. They only won three or four more games than them, so there wasn't a big separation. So I remember that, and I remember it being just a high-energy, great offensive series. But the Kings going to Dallas and winning those two middle games, three and four, um, was really a statement, and it was getting them closer to a spot they'd never been.
Like Jason mentioned, the Dallas Mavericks enjoyed a lot of success against the Kings during the regular season. Dallas was one of just a few teams that could boast a winning record over Sacramento, defeating them in three of their four meetings, including twice by double digits. But the Kings had already seen what little regular season records mattered with their series against Utah, and Bobby Jackson said that Sacramento never took a team lightly, no matter who it was. We didn't go into any series undermining and thinking that we had this series won. We had the confidence at the beginning of the season and in the playoffs that um, we was a dangerous team. We just had to take care of our business, and that's what we did leading up into the uh, Western Conference Finals. Game one in Sacramento wasn't much of a contest. The Kings smoked Dallas 108-91, outscoring the Mavericks 26-17 in the fourth quarter. Peja Stojakovic continued his offensive success, scoring 26 points while also grabbing 10 rebounds. He was one of three Kings with double-doubles. Chris Webber finished with 20 points and 10 rebounds, followed by 18 points and 16 rebounds from Vlade Divac. Game two was a completely different story, although it started out similar to game one. Sacramento built a 36-23 lead at the end of the first quarter, but gave it all back as Dallas won the second quarter 36-24. From then on, the game was back and forth, but a strong 29-point fourth quarter was enough for the Mavericks to secure the Game 2 win. Steve Nash was sensational, scoring a game-high 30 points, Nowitzki added on 22, and microwave bench scorer Nick Van Exel added 19. Once again, the Kings would head out onto the road with the series tied at a game apiece. Doug Christie. We had a real tough time with the Nash and Nowitzki pick and roll. And uh, we, came, we came to practice the next day, uh, and Coach Adelman spins. I mean, he's on top of this pick and roll, every aspect of it. He's going over and over it. And I walk by Webb, and Webb's like, man, we need to get off this pick and roll. Let's just do what we do. We don't have to worry about them. We do what we do, we'll be fine. And he raised his hand, and he said as much to Coach Adelman, and he said, okay. And then from there on, we just, we handled them. Today's Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Built Bar. And Built Bar likes to celebrate your freedom of choice. That's why they give you so many delicious flavors, all incredible and all healthy. They taste like candy bars. They're all covered in 100% chocolate, but you can get flavors like coconut, raspberry, my favorite mint brownie, salted caramel, strawberry orange, and more. And you can find out what your favorite flavor is because everybody has a favorite by going on to Built.com and buying a mixed box. They'll send you a bunch of different flavors. You can pick your favorites. Then when you order your second box, you make sure to order the ones that you love. And all these bars, like I said, are healthy. 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories ranging from 130 to 180, only 4 to 5 grams of sugar, and only 4 to 5 grams of net carbs. Amazing flavors, all tasty and all healthy. Right now, if you go to Built.com and use promo code Locked On, you'll get 15% off your order. Again, that's promo code Locked On for 15% off at Built.com. The Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by our friends over at betonline.ag. It's that time of the year again. All eyes are now turning to football as teams are back on the gridiron to start the football season. Preseason happening right now. And as always, Bet Online is your number one spot for all the pro and college football action this season. Get all the updated odds, props, and contests, including the online's biggest half million dollar NFL mega contest and the world's largest $200,000 NFL survivor contest open now at Bet Online. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today to receive your 100% welcome bonus by using promo code Locked On, And be sure to take advantage of their opening day super promo, meaning you make a bet on Thursday, September 9th, the season opener between the Super Bowl champion Buccaneers and the Dallas Cowboys. And if you lose, your wager will be refunded up to $25 for new customers only when signing up and using promo code NFL100. From football to basketball, boxing, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait and take advantage of all the great offers today for the 2021 season at Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. Game three was a teeter-totter of positive and negative emotions for the Sacramento Kings, who defeated Dallas 125 to 119 in what was a very exciting and high-scoring game. But Sacramento paid for the victory with injuries to both Doug Christie and Peja Stojakovic. Nash a three. And the Mavericks are right back in it. Doug Christie hurt. I didn't see what happened, Jerry. I didn't mean, look like he slipped, actually, so there may be some moisture on the court with all the humidity here in the area. Well, that's the one player you cannot afford to lose. I did not see what happened, but we might get another look here. There you see. see oh, oh, he oh, just oh, turned oh, his oh, ankle. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Yeah, now watch as he comes in, really steps on Chris's foot is actually what he did and turned his ankle. Boy, that, that does not look good. 
Here's a, as he comes through the screen, gets through, and as he's trying to get possession, just steps his foot right on top of Chris's. Oh, just an unfortunate bad step, but that definitely is a, a turned ankle. Could be a, a strain that could affect Doug. No question, he's in some pain. Christie tweaked his ankle during the game, stepping on the foot of Chris Weber while playing defense. Page's injury came late in the third quarter, taking a fall while trying to grab a rebound. Novitski, nope. And Jackson has it. Stojakovic may have rolled an ankle at the other end. He's in agony. Page Stojakovic down at the other end. Weber, Jackson, they want a 20-second timeout. Nobody sees it, and now it's called. If the Kings lose Stojakovic on top of Christie, they are in deep, deep trouble. Christie is already unavailable for the rest of the game. Peja on the baseline, being looked at by Kings trainer Pete Youngman. What else could go wrong here in Game Three for Dallas? You know, he, he may even have, have sprained or strained that calf hamstring. Like it looks like he's rubbing his leg as opposed to his ankle. Well, Pesha Stoyakovich doesn't look like he's going to be able to return. He can't even walk off the floor. Bobby Jackson. I don't remember what exactly happened. I know he sprained his ankle. I don't know how he did it. Um, so, you know, when you lose a guy that's averaging 20-plus points a game, that kind of hinders you. You know, I think if he would have been full board and full speed in the Lakers series, you know, I think – that's an easy, easy – I think that would have been, you know, a highlight of our career just to have a healthy Stojakovic um, that could score anywhere on the floor. And then him missing, what, two, three weeks and then trying to come back and play, it was just his rhythm was off. But I, I can't recall how it happened, but I know he sprained his ankle. Aware that his team was potentially in serious trouble, Doug Christie, who was originally told he would not return to the game, was on the floor for the Kings to start the fourth quarter. Christie would battle through the paint and finish the game with 20 points, 14 of which he scored in the fourth. Again, Pacer Stojakovic has a right ankle sprain. He will not return. Doug Christie, we were told, would not return. But he said, hey, tape it up. Let me lay some tight and let me get back out there on the court. And he'll start this fourth quarter. Quick pause for a peek behind the curtain here, but when I watched the fourth quarter of Game 3 and re-experienced Doug Christie's toughness and heart, I walked over to the Sports 1140 KHDK on-air studio where Doug Christie co-hosts the Grant Napier Show. I asked Doug about that moment, and he told me that when Peja got injured, Doug was in the locker room on the trainer's table getting his ankle looked at by then-head athletic trainer Pete Youngman. When Peja was helped in, telling Doug he didn't believe that he could continue, Doug told Youngman to wrap up his ankle and let let him play. That's the kind of competitor that Doug Christie was, and it was a major reason why the Kings were able to win the game. Just enjoy this stretch here in the fourth quarter, courtesy of Kings TV. Devon's working a pick and roll. Bibby behind the screen. Bibby does it again! Oh, Mike Bibby, how on earth? That's his fifth from beyond the arc. 98 95, 29 for Bibby. Finley walks in. Shot clock. Fans thought it was goaltending. Jackson. Control a little bit. Christie tees up a three. Doug Christie walks it back to the floor. Oh, oh boy. 101 95. A 6 0 run. Behind Christie's heroics and Mike Bibby's red-hot hand, he finished with 29 points, including a perfect 5 of 5 from three-point range. The Kings took a 2-1 to series lead, heading into Game 4, which is widely considered the best game of the series and one of the best games of the 2002 playoffs. In a game where the Dallas Mavericks led for 41 minutes, the Sacramento Kings stole an overtime victory, 115-113, behind the heroics of Bobby Jackson, who started the game at shooting guard, replacing the injured Peja Stoyan. Yakovich. Inside, nice move from Bobby, Bobby Jackson. Jackson off to the races. Novitski one man back. Oh, nice move from Jackson. And with all that's gone on, it's a six-point game. Jackson over Novitski. Oh, Bobby Jackson. What a second-half turnaround for Jackson. Bibby. Jackson for three. Bobby Jackson lighting it up here in the fourth. And just like that, it's a one-point game. I got to think if there's one guy I wasn't going to leave open right now, it might be number 24 in the black jersey. Five minutes remaining. Bobby Jackson puts it in. Bobby Jackson with 13 points here in this fourth quarter. And we've only played just over seven minutes.
That collection of highlights courtesy of NBC. Jackson didn't lead the team in scoring, but 15 of his 24 points came in the fourth quarter after scoring just two points in the whole first half. The Kings outscored the Mavs 27-20 in the fourth to force overtime. Nowitzki makes his move inside. Won't go. Rebound Nowitzki. Tip won't go. Finley. No go. It won't count. And the Sacramento Kings take two games in Dallas and take a commanding 3-1 lead. And we'll head back to that madhouse called Arco Arena in a comfortable position. Chris Webber finished with 30 points and 10 rebounds, followed by another strong outing from Mike Bibby, who scored 24. The Kings overcame 31 from Dirk Nowitzki, 28 from Michael Finley, and 24 from Steve Nash. Grant Napier. I remember it's still to this day, it's maybe the most exciting game I've ever had the pleasure of broadcasting because I was doing the game on radio in the playoff game where the Kings, you know, trailed big in the fourth quarter and had a phenomenal fourth quarter comeback uh, led by uh, Bobby Jackson. He was just brilliant. And I believe that the game went into overtime uh, and the Kings uh, held the Mavericks who had a chance on the very last possession and Dirk Nowitzki missed it. Vlade Divac got the rebound and the Kings uh, won that thrilling, thrilling game. Jerry Reynolds. I think as much as anything, I always felt like the bench was such a key. I remember Bobby Jackson, I thought, was uh, really terrific in that series and created, uh, you know, maybe more problems for the Dallas guards than, than, than our starters. For us, Bobby Jackson might have been, uh, you know, the X factor a little bit, you know, that, that we had a guy that – about every game could come in and make the team better, and I can't say they had the same thing. Bobby Jackson talks about his huge game. There's always pressure when you get when you're a bench guy, you coming in and you starting. I think I started that first first half off playing really <laughs> basketball, and, and so uh, and I got hot in the fourth, and I just I just rolled that wave, and I think we were down ten to twelve points in that fourth quarter, and so I just allowed myself to. You know, just play consistent basketball, uh, be super aggressive uh, offensively and defensively, and then try to guard and defend the best um, scorers in the league, which was Nick Van Exel and Steve Nash. And so we kind of went in, and, you know, I, I remember that game like the back of my head because the fans were talking about a hostile environment. It just allowed me to play at another high level, and so – it was just amazing. It was an amazing game, not just for me, but for our team to accomplish and beat the Dallas Mavericks 4-1. Doug Christie. In the playoffs, Matt, every game is a living, breathing thing. It takes on a life of its own. It's, you, you rarely, maybe in the first round with a really dominant team, might you see, see some games that are similar. It's like, okay, these guys down. But for the most part, Every game is a little bit different. There's going to be a chess move here, a chess move there. In the playoffs, someone steps up usually that doesn't necessarily step up. Hedo might have a really big game. You know, uh, Sean Bradley might knock down some shots and we weren't expecting. So uh, that, is the, that is the life in the playoffs for sure in the NBA. Grant Napier. The Kings just had that resiliency about them in that Maverick series. It was an incredible, thrilling series. But I think that one game, the overtime game, the game in Dallas in which Bobby Jackson uh, was just brilliant uh, bringing the team from behind. And he wasn't alone, but that to me was a real turning point in the entire playoffs. It would be unfair to say that the Dallas Mavericks quit after the overtime loss at home in Game 4, but Grant was right when he called that win a turning point for the Kings. Game 5 in a sold-out Arco Arena, the Sacramento Kings put the nail in the coffin, defeating Dallas 114-101. to Carmichael Dave remembers as the series came to a close, that arena filling with the deafening Beat LA chance from a euphoric Kings crowd. I remember a lot from that series, but there's two things that stick out. A lot of people forget this. Nobody nobody looks at Peja Stojakovic's career and thinks about him defensively. But Peja locked up with Dirk Nowitzki that whole series. When they were on each other, Peja played the best defense of his life, and it absolutely wasn't close. His defense was so good on Dirk that it actually made me wonder why he couldn't play that type of defense uh, at other times. And the answer there is that he would have been absolutely exhausted. People don't remember that, that Peja Stojakovic gave – everything on defense in that series and he matched up with Dirk tremendously that's that's number one number two game five uh Kings just worked the Mavericks they worked them and I will never forget the the crowd 
chanting, beat L.A., beat L.A., starting like early in the fourth quarter. It was all about, okay, Dallas is about to be in our rearview mirror, even though we've got about 10 minutes of game left. That's it. Let's put it on our shoulders. It's all about the rematch, and I've never been more excited for a basketball game in my entire life. Finley, three ball, blocked by Christie. And they can sense it now. 111.99. Jackson, a three. I think the Jello's jiggling. will stop the clock 56 seconds left i've never heard it louder here at arco time out and the fans are loving it here in arco truly an amazing scene this evening in sacramento you can call it a miracle five years ago this team struggling disarray some would say rick adelman comes in first year 27 and 23 in the abbreviated season then a five round five game loss to the lakers after they had went the distance with the jazz in that first year last year getting swept by the lakers and now on their way to the western conference finals it's all over Final call of the Western Conference semifinals courtesy of Kings TV. Bobby Jackson remembers the beat LA chance giving him chills while standing on the floor. The arena, the atmosphere was electric. Uh, it, it gave us chills. It gave me chills just to hear that, just to see and have the city behind us. Um, and, and it showed what Sacramento basketball is all about. Show what the loyalty of our fans was all about. And um, it, it kind of gave us a lot of edge and a lot of confidence, and we play with a lot of cockiness in that series. Tomorrow, on the third and final part of 2002, the three-part miniseries, relive all seven games of the Kings versus Lakers Western Conference Finals, considered one of the greatest, most competitive, and most controversial playoff series in NBA history. Until then, my name is Matt George. This has been 2002, the three-part miniseries, remembering the Sacramento Kings' great and terrible year, presented by the Locked On Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.